Hello, Auggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG. You're with another episode of Ask Dave. Today, our question comes from Joseph N6BFG. Um, and he says, I was wondering, does the current amount of sunspots affect the ionosphere and increase propagation at night? Yes. Or does this only occur during the daytime? Technically, yes. Let's take a look at the world. The whole world in our grasp. Okay. I'm going to make terra firma green. Okay, here is the earth. TH. And over here, in bright and shiny pink, is the sun. And the sun sends out what's called the solar wind. And that's made of charged particles. And the charged particles hit the Earth's magnetic field. And the charged particles tend to follow these magnetic field lines. So if one of them gets caught here, it tends to follow it down here to where it goes into the Earth. Okay, this process of putting a lot of charged energy down here into the atmosphere creates the aurora. And there's the aurora, the northern lights and the southern lights. The same thing happens down here, okay. Um, this happens on all planets that have magnetic fields. <clears throat> I've seen very cool pictures of Saturn with the aurora showing. Now, the other thing that the sun sends out, and this is very important, we'll use orange for that, is where there are sun spots, which can be thought of as blemishes on the face of the sun. They are somewhat cooler than the surface of the sun. The surface of the sun is about 5,000 Kelvin. Okay, and this, by the way, if you heat a filament in a light bulb to 5,000 Kelvin, it's not degrees Kelvin, it's Kelvin, um, then it will glow with the same color as the sun. It'll be nice bright white. Okay, that's the color temperature of sunlight. But these emit radiation differently. They don't admit as much visible radiation, so they look black on the sun. Sunspots, I guess I should make a sunspot black. Okay, and black on there. These things push out a lot of ultraviolet radiation, okay? Now, what the ultraviolet radiation affects is not the magnetosphere, as much as the ionosphere, and the ionosphere is closer to Earth, it's about 75 to maybe 300 miles. Okay, now this ultraviolet here causes air atoms up here to, and then you've got oxygen, too, and you've got a lot of nitrogen into up here. These are the main constituents of oxygen. And these right here will knock an electron out of orbit in one of these here, thus ionizing this. So you have free electrons roaming around in the sphere here, okay? And you've got positive ions up there too. Now these will eventually recombine with each other. But if there's enough ultraviolet light, um, you'll get a, a transient, a granted a transient effect, but it can last a day or more, okay? If you get a huge solar flare, this can come down. Solar flares actually are particulate matter 
that come down, hit the magnetosphere, but also come in and hit the ionosphere and really, really, really charge it up. Now, this is sort of a Goldilocks kind of thing. We want some ionization, but not too much. If there's too much ionization, a radio signal from the Earth will hit the ionosphere and simply be absorbed. If there's just the right amount of ionization, it will go up and be hit, kicked back down, okay? And uh, through a process that's actually refraction, but involves the free electrons and the ionized uh, positive elements here. If it's not ionized enough, then the signal just goes through into outer space, waiting for some extraterrestrial somewhere to uh, watch our old uh, television shows. So um, think of it this way. If you've got an antenna pointed at the horizon, it's pointed off into outer space at the same time. Okay. Now, so that's what the ionization does. Now, where are we? Uh, in terms of the sun and the sun spots. The number of spots, spots, follows an 11 year cycle, 11 years. It's technically 22 years. You get um, sunspots polarized a certain way for 11 years, back down to about zero, and then the sunspots in the next cycle are polarized the other way. So for a complete cycle, it's 22 years. But um, Now, right now the sun is not terribly active, um, so we're not getting a lot of sunspots. If we had lots of sunspots, if you have too many, like I said, this is a Goldilocks thing, you can over-ionize the ionosphere and it won't, it just absorbs everything. Okay, um, the more sunspots are ionized, um, the higher the frequency you can use for these reflections. And there are layers in the ionosphere. And um, this is uh, unfortunately about to scale. There's the E layer, the F layer, and the um, D, the D D, E, and F layers, okay? The D layer is closest to the Earth, and during the day, it is ionized so heavily that it prohibits communications over any particular length of sky waves on 80 and 160, sometimes 40. The E layer is a weird layer. It tends to be sporadic, uh, meaning it's not terribly predictable. It doesn't happen everywhere. But this is really good for the VHF or, you know, some like six meters, 10 meters, and so on, and usually in the middle of the day. Now, the F layer here um, is split into two. There's an F1 and an F2 up here and they work during the day on the higher frequencies. Now as the sun turns away it carries its atmosphere with it. Okay so the stuff that was charged during the day comes around to the other side. The D layer disappears, the E layers often disappear, and the F1 and the F2 layers merge into an F layer over here. And this is higher than the E layer, D layer. So you can get long hops at night um, on 80, because 80 is absorbed during the day by D. 40, 20. Right now, you get into the evening, you get some ionospheric propagation that will help you with 40. 20 goes away after a while, but it will depend on how many uh, spots there are. We are just starting the new cycle, cycle 25. Uh, these were started to be counted when Galileo had his telescope. So we're the 25th cycle uh, since then. It's just getting started. We're about a year, year and a half into it. 
um, it will peak in another four or five years. And then it will slowly taper away until we get sunspots of the other polarization. Okay, I can recall at times at 11 p.m. at night, 15 meters from all the way over to Asiatic Russia. It was amazing what the sunspot layers could do. So to answer your question simply, <clears throat> so Joseph, to answer your question simply, um, do the sunspots we have today affect the ionosphere? The answer is yes, they do. And we like it and we want more. Um, do they affect it at night? Yes, because as the Earth rotates, it drags its atmosphere over around into night. And so the layers that were ionized during the day tend to stay ionized during the night. Now, as the sunspot cycle goes up and hits its peak with the most sunspots, we'll get the most ionosphere and you get more good stuff at night. Okay. Now, the, the study of the ionosphere is uh, really complicated. Uh, but it can be, uh, if not mastered, at least get a good understanding of it just by looking at uh, Wikipedia, skipping math, and, and uh, looking at the layers and so on, and finding out uh, what it does, what the propagation is like, and so on. Basically, during the day, you're going to use higher frequencies. At night, you'll use somewhat lower frequencies. Um, but as we get more sunspots, that can change, okay? But uh, the D layer is almost always completely ionized during the day. So no 80 meters or 160 meters in the day, unless you're doing ground wave, which has nothing to do with the ionosphere. So there you have it. Um, and good luck with that. By the way, the people who discovered the ionosphere, there were two who postulated it about the same time. Um, and there was the Heaviside, I think it was Oliver Heaviside, and a guy by the name of Kennelly. And it's been was called the Kennelly Heaviside layer for a long time. He postulated it had to be there. And uh, in fact, it was. Uh, Oliver Heaviside is, was an amazing, eclectic, and very strange man. Um, and sometimes it's just called the Heaviside layer. But uh, there you have it. Until we next meet, 73.